Um, I will um, gladly introduce our two speakers tonight. We're really fortunate to have two very distinguished speakers with us um, to talk about the outdoor sculpture of the seminary. Carol Grissom uh, is going to speak first. She is um, going to talk to us about the past, present, and future of zinc statuary on the campus. And she'll be followed by Fred Gervasi, who will follow with a discussion of the non-zinc statues and a brief update on the SOS's sculpture project. Fred is a retired nonprofit executive. Um, you'll probably recognize him. He's been around for quite a while in SOS. He lives across the street. Um, and he's our former president, recently uh, retired from our board. Very sorry to miss him. Um, and um, Carol Grissom is our, uh, second, our first speaker. And she is the senior objects conservator at the Smithsonian Conservation Institute. Um, she's been in that position since 1984. In addition to working here in DC, she has held positions doing conservation in St. Louis, Udine, Italy, Rome, Brussels, Detroit, and New York. So uh, we're very fortunate to have someone uh, as familiar with conservation as Carol. She's also the author of numerous publications, um, including ch several chapters and books on conservation, and numerous journal articles in journals such as uh, the American Journal of Archaeology, the Journal of the American Institute for Conservation, Studies in Conservation, and several proceedings for international congresses on conservation topics. And last but not least, she is the author of Zinc Sculpture in America from 1850 to 1950, which is a remarkable work, um, which was just published last year. And we're fortunate that um, Carol has brought a few copies with her. If anybody's interested in purchasing a lovely Christmas gift for somebody or gift for yourself, um, they're at the back of the room. And I, again, I won't grovel anymore. Um, without further ado, Carol. <coughs> I just remembered I wanted a pointer. Um, there were uh, several thousand uh, zinc sculptures erected in, in the United States uh, in the last quarter of the 19th century and uh, into the 20th century. Um, I attempted to catalog all the ones I could find out about in, in my book. Um, this all started. Uh, in about 1980 when I saw this uh, zinc monument at Gettysburg National Military Park. Uh, I had no idea what it was at the time, but I was asked to do a, a treatment proposal for it, and uh, the rest is history. I, I, I um, discovered there was almost nothing written on these uh, monuments and statues, uh, and I uh, proceeded to collect them over the years, and that ultimately it resulted in the book. Um, I was, um, uh, let's see, uh, I guess we should go to the next slide. Uh, the production of zinc sculpture began in Germany around 1830. Um, it was, uh, th this is one of the most famous uh, zinc statues at that time, uh, the Amazon on horseback attacked by a lion. It was, uh, 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 displayed by uh, a Berlin-based company ca uh, called Geis at the very famous uh, Crystal Palace exhibition in London in 1851. And, and then the company displayed it again at, in uh, New York at the Crystal Palace in 1853-54. Um, at the, the first Crystal Palace, it was considered the uh, uh, statue of the exhibition. Um, and it was reproduced in bronze afterward for the Neues Museum in Berlin, and there's also a copy on the grounds of the Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, now. I think that one was actually made quite a bit later. Um, the, the major impetus for zinc statuary uh, was uh, an enormous uh, new production of, of zinc metal uh, at the beginning of the 19th century uh, that was uh, there, there was so much production that, that the price of the metal dropped to almost nothing, and people began to look around for new uses of it. Um, it was discovered that you could make statues in zinc much more cheaply than you could make a bronze statue. Uh, one of the main reasons is that uh, zinc melts at a, a much lower temperature, 400 and some degrees centigrade, and, and you can uh, put zinc pieces together with ordinary lead tin solder. Uh, the result of that was 
uh, that you could make a statue in a lot of small pieces and just solder it together. Um, and, and you could do it rather quickly uh, at low cost. Um, next slide. Uh, here I show you uh, an example of, of the pieces. This is a doughboy on the left, and then you can see some of the pieces of which it's composed. And many statues were made of a lot more pieces than, than this. I, it just happened to not have very good other, uh, other very good photographs of it. Next. Um, in this uh, case, you can see um, the, uh, the lead tin solder seams. They're dark against the, the white um, uh, color of the zinc. Next. Um, zinc was considered very unattractive. That was one of its uh, biggest uh, downsides. It's a kind of a dull gray. Um, and so the zinc statues were always treated to imitate something else. In the case of that Fourth Ohio Infantry Monument, uh, the monument was actually sandblasted and it was meant to look like stone. Uh, a popular treatment for some of the Indians was to paint them in multicolors with polychromy in the fashion of a tobacco store Indian. Uh, most of the statues uh, that I think were on the grounds here were actually treated, uh, were painted to look like uh, a, a bronze, a, that is a, a dark brown typically. Um, and you can see here's the uh, Hiawatha in this historic photograph um, in front of the mission. You can see it's really quite a dark color. In a lot of the early um, uh, catalogs of the uh, National Park Seminary, in fact, they refer to the statues as bronzes. Uh, I'm, I don't know whether they knew that they weren't. Um, so, um, next slide. Uh, here you see the Hiawatha now. Um, this was the, the reason I came out here for the first time around 1990. Um, I had seen this uh, statue illustrated in um, James Goode's uh, sculpture book on Washington, D.C. Um, I, I knew it was the same statue because I'd seen other copies of the same statue, but uh, he had actually um, written that it was uh, made out of cast iron, and so I wanted to check it out. Uh, next. Uh, I was delighted also to discover this um, uh, statue of the Greek water carrier across the street. Um, at that time, I didn't know this statue, but I subsequently found out there were a number of other copies, including one that Milton Hershey bought for his uh, garden at Hershey Park. Um, uh, of course, most of you probably know this was subsequently stolen, and uh, now there's a, a light fixture in its place. Uh, next. Uh, I just wanted to show you, this is how, when I saw it, it was, uh, you can't see it very well, it's right here, rather unattractively, um, uh, set in this, what was basically a parking lot or road. Uh, but I, I show you also this uh, historic photograph from, from one of the seminary yearbooks where it was, it was uh, in the same location but it was in the middle of a garden. Um, I, I don't think, I don't need to talk about the history of the National Park Seminary, I think, to this group, but you all know, so do we say finishing school for young ladies? Uh, started in 1894, and many of my illustrations come from the catalogs that were sent out annually, uh, I guess, to uh, solicit interest. Uh, during that same, that same visit, I saw uh, Theo and Leo, uh, which you see in the upper slide, and then you see a historic photograph down below. Um, uh, uh, I, I know other copies of these. Uh, these uh, statues were actually uh, copies of uh, statues that were made in Berlin in zinc. And in fact, I think uh, a number of uh, statues were brought to, to New York from Berlin and, and later copied here directly from uh, the original Berlin statues. Next. Um, then on another visit, I came out here uh, with, um, uh, who was that? Um, Rick, Rick Schaffer, who took me down the basement and showed me this uh, poor griffin. Uh, 
and you can see the illustration from one of the catalogs on the, on the right. Oh, I forgot to mention, very important, those lions, one of them has uh, uh, an inscribed foundry plaque uh, that says J.L. Mott Ironworks. Um, and so uh, I've also discovered that um, most of the statues that are here um, are found in catalogs of the J.L. Mott Ironworks, and that's what you see uh, the illustration in the illustration on the right. Um, next. Uh, here you can see, uh, this is uh, a wartime uh, image of, of the grounds and what I, I've circled over on the right where the griffin was. And then if you see the next slide, uh, I have a little detail of it. You can see that it's the same uh, statue. Here you, know, you notice also they painted it kind of a, a dark color that was probably meant to imitate bronze. Next. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the Andromeda, which was in the music building. Uh, you can see it in this uh, historic photograph. Is this not, I don't think this is working. Uh, uh, above the doorway. Um, this was uh, shown to me by Jack Boucher, who was taking photographs uh, for the Historic American Building Survey. Um, and he also showed me the next one, which was an eagle, uh, quite uh, fragmented. Um, and I'll sh in the next slide, you'll see um, it in an historic photograph on a post. Um, and I also show you there, there are identical, uh, a, d a pair of identical eagles that are on posts at the entrance to the soldier's home in Washington. Um, Jack was also, uh, also told me about a report that a woman named Cynthia Ott had done for the Historic American Building Survey about this time. And when I spoke to her, she told me uh, about the, um, the catalogs of the National Park Seminary and, and that there was a run of them at, in the uh, DC Public Library, which I, I then went to look at. And that's where I got most of um, these images. I understand that, that uh, in your archives, uh, there's also a pretty much of a full run of them. Um, this is, is an image from, from one of those catalogs. And you can see here the, the Amazon was in the lobby uh, of the main building. Um, it's also interesting to note that uh, Jordan Mott, uh, the principal, of, or one of the principals of the uh, J.L. Mott Ironworks, had, had the same statue in his conservatory in his mansion on Fifth Avenue. Um, and, and the Mott Company uh, displayed the statue at the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia in 1876, which was roughly 25 years after uh, Geis had displayed it in London. Next. Uh, is that the exact same statue, or is that just a copy? It's, it, Mott made it in New York. Yeah, it, it's a copy, yes. Um, uh, then the, I, I got really fascinated by this and, de and figured out that, that, I, that, I, that um, many of the lost statues from Forest Glen must have been made out of zinc, and I started scrutinizing all the images that I could find. Um, about this time, I also met Bonnie Rosenthal, who uh, sold me Enchanted Forest Glen and, um, and gave me a copy, lent me a copy of the, the view book. Um, and also, I, I believe, gave me a copy of this bird's eye view of, uh, of the National Park Seminary, um, which is being, I guess you're selling them back on the table. Anyway, this is a detail of uh, the, the um, uh, Odeon and the music building, and uh, I think that uh, the statues on both buildings uh, at the roof line were made out of zinc. I, I could identify um, uh, the ones uh, on, on this theater as uh, Cleo Concordia, Don, uh, Donied, um, Diligence Flora, Liberty, and Psyche. Next slide. Uh, and there's also uh, a statue of Hebe sitting. Uh, Hebe was uh, the goddess who diluted um, uh, wine with water and is a symbol of temperance, actually. Um, and next slide. Um, 
Uh, here you see a uh, detail of the music building, and then in the next slide, uh, I've coupled a detail of those figures with uh, the stat some of the statues from the, um, the Mott catalog. You can see spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Um, next. Uh, this is the gymnasium, and on, on its roof, uh, I believe there were four uh, statues of Atlas. Uh, next. Uh, and then uh, uh, in, the, in front of the Miller Library, which is just across the street, there were a pair, there were a pair of griffins. Um, uh, this one I wasn't so sure about, um, uh, so I didn't actually put it in my book, but uh, there's a boy and goose pair that's uh, uh, up above the main entrance. I actually think it probably was. Um, uh, the same statue. I, this, the, the little figure's arm isn't in quite the right place, but I think it's probably twisted in the uh, statue that you see on the right. Um, next. Uh, and then there are all the bridges that uh, crossed the, the ravines. Uh, and there are at least three of them had uh, pairs of animals on them that were made out of zinc. Um, next slide. Uh, here's a pair of roaring uh, lions, and then the next, uh, this is, that they're on the honeysuckle bridge, uh, and the Mott illustration is in the lower right. Uh, next, uh, there are a pair of uh, dogs uh, that were on the dog bridge, um, and then next, uh, there were a pair of sphinxes uh, on the sphinx bridge. Uh, and you can also see there's a candelabrum there uh, that's a dead ringer for the, um, for the Mott cat candelabrum. Uh, next, there's a, there was a second one uh, that's probably a little hard to see, uh, but it was the mate of the other one uh, that was on the grounds, um, I guess kind of near the pagoda here. Um, next, uh, and then, uh, there was a reclining deer just kind of sitting on the lawn somewhere. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Mott. This is uh, not, a not very sharp uh, illustration of the, the foundry plaque that's on one of the lions, and it says the, the J.L. Mott Ironworks. Uh, <coughs> next. Uh, Mott was uh, also was a huge company that um, uh, is probably more famous for its plumbing equipment. And in fact, uh, Marcel Duchamp bought uh, a urinal from Mott that he then turned a fountain and scandalized, scandalized the world with. And he also signed it, uh, our Mott, as sort of a play on, on Mott. Um, next. Um, the firm. Um, had, had premises in the Bronx initially. Uh, I took this photograph on the left from the Second Avenue Bridge between the Bronx and uh, Manhattan. Uh, and the arrow points, to, you can't see it very well in this slide, unfortunately, but the, where the arrow points to where it says the J.L. Mott Ironworks in the brickwork. And there's this uh, 1871 illustration of, of the Mott premises uh, in the lower right, and, and, and the smaller building that you see on the left, I is almost, I'm almost certain is the same building uh, up there on the left. Um, uh, Jordan Mott, the one who had the Amazon in his conservatory, was quite a, a famous man, and he, uh, well, no, actually that was his father, now that I think about it, who invented stoves. He was a famous inventor, and in fact, uh, he was the person uh, who organized a, a painting of famous inventors that's at the National Por Portrait Gallery, and his portrait is among them. Um, next slide. Uh, then, then the uh, Mott moved to more modern, larger premises in Trenton, which you can see uh, here. Um, uh, the interesting thing, though, is that as regards to the zinc statues, Mott didn't actually make them. They made a lot of other stuff, but they didn't make the statues. Instead, they retailed them from a, a, a very modest zinc uh, foundry that was in, Brook in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. In, in the next slide, you'll see it. Um, 
they lived in the, the house next door and worked in, in, in the building on the right. Uh, this was M MJ Selig and Company. Uh, Selig sold things directly and they also mar uh, had them retailed through uh, the Dale Mott Iron Works and J.W. Fisk, which was the other major um, outfit that sold them. Um, next. Uh, so the question comes up, uh, why do they have all these? Now, I'm not an art historian. I'm actually an, an art conservator. Uh, but there are some wonderful quotations uh, like this one. The, the authorities of the school believing, in fact, knowing that the influence of these arts in molding the character of young girls passing from girlhood into women, womanhood is tremendously potent. When they are viewing the products of the arts, their minds are filled with beautiful thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, I actually think that uh, that probably the reason, one of the reasons um, they um, decorated the campus with with so many statues was that they were cheap, and and that they got a deal. Um, most of the zinc statues uh, were. Uh, sold in the last quarter of the, of the 19th century. Um, and very, the, the production and sales really dwindled in the 20th century. And in fact, uh, Sealy closed down in um, 1927, and the, the latest Mott uh, uh, statues that I know of from uh, erection dates were, were dedicated in the early 20s. Um, here, uh, I found the statues uh, earliest in 1924 catalogs. Uh, now, it's possible some of them were purchased earlier. Uh, as I understand it, there are no purchase records. But that's, that's very late for zinc statues. And I, get, I would guess uh, that, that either Mott or Selig was, was selling everything they had left. And, uh, the fellow who was running the National Park Seminary just bought the whole works. Um, so uh, next slide. Uh, so then I wanted to talk a little bit about what hap happens to zinc statues. Uh, zinc is very brittle, and uh, they, they, the biggest disadvantage is that they tend to break. Um, here's a photograph of, uh, the Kester, from the Kester House Museum in Marysville, Kansas. Uh, the good news is that you can repair them, and I try to encourage people to do that. Uh, the other important point is that since, since, they're, since they're made of all these little pieces, uh, they, they sometimes will come apart at the seams, and so when you look at a broken statue, and I, I think that the eagle is probably one of those, M many of the pieces that would appear to be broken are probably just disassembled. And if you did have a, 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 a conservator, you could probably uh, uh, put them back together. One, one would have to look to make sure that there, all the pieces are there, but I, it, I wouldn't be surprised if it's possible. Um, then the second issue, next slide, is, uh, oh wait, this is, uh, well, it, it is the issue of painting. Um, uh, now, why would you paint? Uh, if, you, if you have a statue outdoors and it's unpainted, uh, you'll get these unsightly uh, dark seams from the lead tin solder that you see in, in this statue of Captain Jack. Um, next slide. Um, the other reason, uh, other two reasons to paint are A, uh, that uh, they were meant to be painted. Um, they were never. Uh, displayed without paint um, or without some kind of surface treatment. Um, and zinc corrodes at roughly twice the rate of copper, so you, you would want to do it for protective reasons. Um, I show you um, uh, this slide. I, I did take a, cross, a, a little paint sample from uh, the Greek water carrier before she disappeared and mounted it and looked at it through a microscope. If you see the, you want to do the next slide, it's a little bit easier to see. Uh, the area below the dotted line is, is probably the original paint. Um, and, and you'll see there's a, a reddish brown uh, paint, I said paint on this, but it's actually a primer. 
Uh, and then typically they would make these paints uh, using copper alloy flakes uh, and then a varnish to give it a little bit of a, of a gloss. Uh, this would probably produce a kind of uh, spark, a little bit of uh, a brown paint with a little bit of sparkle. Um, next, uh, wait, and at the top you can see this ugly chrome yellow paint that's all over all the, all the army, that the army seems to have painted everything here with. It, it's actually a primer. Uh, so there are a number of options for trying to recreate um, an imitation bronze paint. Um, this is uh, a traditional commercial paint that's been applied to the statue on the left. I personally find this uh, unacceptable. It looks too much like radiator paint to me. Uh, and uh, I show you the slide on the right, which is, was taken about uh, nine years later. And uh, the very same paint has, has turned dull, and, and a lot of the copper flakes have started to um, dissolve, uh, then staining that concrete pedestal that you see there uh, with, with the green from the copper. The, the pedestal was new when this was put back up. Uh, next, uh, this is a, a, a lovely job uh, that was done, at least I think so, at, at Vassar College of this Benjamin Franklin. A conservator uh, varied the coloration, uh, having sort of uh, lighter tones and highlights on the high areas and darker tones in the depths, the way that uh, traditional bronze would have been uh, patinaed. Next. Uh, and, and then this is my final slide. I show you uh, a case uh, which is probably a little easier to do where someone has just uh, painted a, a statue a dark brown with a dark, with a dark brown commercial paint. Uh, this is actually on Martha's Vineyard, and in the background is the ocean not very far away. And this has held up very well, I must say, uh, over 10 years. So that, uh, the next is the end for me. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the statues uh, on the seminary, particularly the outdoor uh, statues that are not made of zinc. And I do that just to kind of fill in the gap. Uh, the, I think Carol did a great job of making clear just how important the zinc sculpture is to our campus. Uh, but we don't want to forget a few, uh, a few things made from other uh, 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 less prominent materials. Um, the, um, uh, the first slide shows us the porch of the maidens. And, and uh, this is a, a, a structure, I, I'm, I think most of you have seen it. It connects the uh, chapel with Aloha House. Uh, it, uh, it consists of uh, uh, 10 caryatids. I'll explain that word in a minute, but 10, uh, uh, ten statues uh, that, uh, um, well, I think I'll explain it right now, 10, ten statues that, that were actually columns that functioned, functional columns, that held up a beam or, 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 or the roof of a building, or in this case, the roof of a porch. Uh, they, they call caryatids after uh, the women of Carrie uh, in, in Greece, who were handmaidens to a uh, prominent goddess at the time. Uh, that may not be important to us now. Uh, but what is important is that the ancient Greeks had discovered uh, or had developed the artistry of of designing columns in the shape of a, of a young woman, designing them so that the, the narrowest part of the sculpture, the, the woman's neck, was still strong enough to hold, you know, to bear the weight of the, uh, the beam that, that, it was, that it was holding up. Um, they, they, uh, they carved their caryatids out of stone. Uh, we had, uh, uh, or the, the seminary uh, uh, administrators had access to technology that was a bit more modern. These are, from, are made out of a, a, a concrete substance, and they are reinforced inside with, uh, with steel rods. Um, now, the Porch of the Maidens is in fantastic shape, and we, we are blessed to have it such. Uh, but the next slide, um, there, there was another group of caryatids on the campus, a group of 20, that formed the Statuary Colonnade. And this colonnade, these, these caryatids supported a, a T-shaped glass-covered walkway that connected the gymnasium to the Port Cochere at Aloha House, but also had a section that connected that span 
uh, crossed Linden Lane and connected to a building known as Recitation House that has been lost long ago. So the T-shape with, with, with 20 caryatids, it was an impressive uh, structure. These caryatids are different from the first set that you saw. Um, they're, um, uh, they're, they are called, let's see if I can get the right word for this. Um, they are called canaphorae, which means basket, basket bearers. There are some people in this audience I know like to call them potheads, but it's not, not true, basket bearers. Um, and uh, because they supported baskets on their heads to represent uh, maidens who carried objects that were sacred to, uh, to the goddess Artemis and Athena. Now, during the army tenure at the seminary, Recitation House succumbed to termites, and the covered walkway was damaged by a truck. This would be in about the 1940s. Most of the 20 caryatids from this structure were either destroyed or lost or given away or sold. Can we go to the next slide. Two of them remain in the possession of the seminary, uh, and they have been placed near Immense Street uh, in an area where they will help to, uh, to mark the interpretive trail, which when it is completed will connect Ireland Drive carriage trail with the main part of the campus. So we have two of them left, but that's, uh, that's all. I want to mention one story though, one, one uh, uh, sequence that gives you an idea of what, what happens in the life of a uh, uh, of a statue when it leaves the seminary grounds. A few years ago, we wrote to a homeowner on Jones Mill Road to ask them about four caryatids in their backyard. Uh, and uh, they're, they're clearly visible from a walking trail uh, that runs parallel to Jones Mill. Now, he showed our letter to, to his father. The homeowner showed, showed the letter we sent him to his father and his father was able to refresh his memory as to how the family came to own them. The first owner of the house bought the caryatids from the army in the 1940s. The third owner of the house incorporated the caryatids into a grape arbor behind his house. By the mid-90s, the son, this would be the son of the third owner of the house, uh, uh, built a second house behind his father's house dismantled the, the grape arbor because it was deteriorated beyond repair, and he repaired the caryatids, and he moved them to a present location. Could you move to the next slide? Uh, to the present location, uh, and, um, uh, and there they stand now. Uh, we, uh, we talked to the man. He was not willing to give them up to us. He did, he did have a strong legal claim to them. Um, this, um, uh, the, they were lost, the statues were lost to the seminary during a time when, when the, the army had a legal right to dispose of them and uh, the, the seminary was not part of a protected historic district. Uh, but they do stand not far from us. Uh, they are protected by, uh, uh, by a fence, by, uh, by a security system. Uh, they are kept in good repair. They are visible to the public. Uh, we have free, free access to taking photographs of them, and, uh, and the owner is, uh, uh, is, is open and willing to, uh, uh, to let people admire them as they walk by on the trail and come as close as, as they can to them without passing through the fence, of course. But it's awfully close. You can get a good view. Now, I don't know if I have a second one of those. Could you go to the next? No, okay, we're moving on to something else. Uh, so that's, that finishes up the story of the caryatids, but, and it also finishes up the Greek element of, uh, uh, of the seminary. We're gonna move on to Rome. Um, here we have Minerva. Minerva is uh, located behind the Italian villa dormitory. That's way across the glen and close to the beltway, close to the railroad tracks. Um, the Romans um, uh, created the goddess uh, Minerva by simply renaming the Greek goddess Athena. Uh, and to the Greeks, Athena had been the goddess of wisdom um, and, and, of, uh, and of agriculture and trade, but the Romans added to her the title of goddess of war 
and got us a victory. Um, this, uh, this version of, uh, of uh, Minerva used to stand in, uh, in a, an elaborate garden that has uh, deteriorated, um, but we, uh, we do know that the villa and the gardens were constructed in 1907, and a contemporary map indicates that uh, there was a statue in place at the time of their construction. Now, um, Minerva is made of cast, um, cast concrete, which means it's, a, uh, it's an architectural form of, or, or, or a, 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 not an architectural, but a design form of, of concrete. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very, very high grade. Um, uh, she's depicted in a draped robe with a castle-like crown, a shield, and a caduceus, which is a staff uh, complete with entwined snakes. The castle may refer to her role as the protector uh, of the city, uh, Rome in this case. Uh, the shield may be a reference to war and to the assurance of victory. But if we move next to the next slide, uh, we have uh, Silva. And Silva is a little more difficult to, uh, to get the right story on, but, but Silva is the Latin word for forest or woods and she may be the goddess of the forest or of nature. Or she may be Rhea Silvia, who was the mother of Romulus and Remus. But she's also known as the goddess of mechanical arts. And it's in that guise that we have her represented here. She has a hammer on her shoulder, and she has a wheel or a gear of some kind by her side. Um, and, uh, and she is also made from uh, cast concrete. There is a third statue uh, beyond, uh, beyond the Glen, uh, and I don't have a slide with me for, for this one. Um, we usually refer to that statue as blind justice, uh, but the statue has all of the characteristics of the traditional statues of Justitia, the Roman goddess of justice. It's got the blindfold that stands for objectivity, the double-edged sword that symbolizes the power of reason and justice, and the scale that represents the balance of opposing arguments. Uh, the sword and the scale have been broken off. Uh, we have just the, just the blindfold to depend on now. But um, blind justice is interesting because of the date that's incised on it. 1867, that's long before the seminary was founded. Uh, we surmise that these three statues were created for other sites and acquired together by the seminary early in the 20th century, about the time the villa was constructed. Kind of a replay of the, the story that, uh, that Carol told about the acquisition of, uh, of, uh, of, of, Zeek, of zinc uh, statues. Well, we're going to leave the classical world behind, uh, almost completely, not quite, but uh, uh, we'll leave that behind for a little while. The next slide is a uh, concrete standing lion. It's one of a pair. We have two of them. They're now in storage. They were once located on, in different locations along Linden Lane, once on the immense side of Linden Lane, once on the, uh, the Cassidy side of Linden Lane. And they will be placed again close to Linden Lane on each side of Cassidy Street to form a kind of a gateway into the core of the, uh, of the seminary. Uh, next slide. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a bronze, we think, statue of Joan of Arc. Uh, she, of course, you know, was a teenage girl who led a French army to victories during the Hundred Years' War in the early 1400s. She's viewed as a national hero and a patron saint of France. Uh, however, here she is portrayed as a simple, devout peasant. Um, a beautiful uh, uh, statue, and it's, it, uh, it sits at the, on a pedestal at the end of the staircase uh, at um, um, Senior House. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, Joan of Arc later. We'll get back to it. But the next slide. Is, is called the, uh, the Grief of Cyparissus. It's one of the most appealing works of art on the campus. It's a marble statue, and it represents a young man grieving over a deer that he has killed. 
Seminary publications refer to it as the grief of Acteon, but it's pretty clear that it's not that. It's the grief, the grief of Cyparissus. Um, Cyparissus was a young man who killed his favorite stag by accident. To ease the inconsolable grief of the man, the gods changed him into a cypress tree, and the cypress has ever since been a symbol of grief. And he, he, uh, he remains now in that grief-stricken pose uh, among, uh, in a very sylvan setting among, among a, a group of trees. Uh, a few years ago, one of the members of our board, Nan Lo, saw a plastic version of, of our sculpture in the uh, Academia in Florence, Italy. It was labeled Cipariso and attributed to the sculptor Antonio Puccinelli. Uh, we take this to be evidence that our interpretation is correct. Uh, we hate to disagree with the, uh, the, the uh, publications of the seminary, but occasionally we do. Um, but of course, the students had uh, a different uh, uh, feeling toward this statue. Uh, long before the Capitol Beltway was built in the 60s, there, were, there was a footbridge, actually there were many bridges, several bridges, from the railroad station onto the campus. And, and a student knew that if they, they heard a train, before they passed this statue at the head of one of those bridges, they were too late. They had missed the train. So for the students, um, uh, all too often, this statue was a statue of a different kind of grief. My God, I've missed my train. <laughs> OK, I think that's the last, the last slide I have. And uh, uh, my timing is good, because I have one more thing I want to talk about. Then we'll have time for questions and answers, most of which I hope you'll direct toward Carol. Uh, but I'd be happy if you directed some to me as well. But I think it's very obvious from Carol's incredibly informative presentation and from my brief comments that the sculptures at National Park Seminary are an important part of what makes this place historic and what makes this place beautiful. SOS, with the help of many, many people, has been working to save the buildings and much of the open space uh, of this campus. But saving the seminary would not be complete unless we also saved the sculpture. In May of this year, we announced our commitment to restore the seminary's outdoor sculpture to their appropriate place on the campus, to renew them by repairing the effects of damage and neglect, and to remember with photographs and documentation those that have been lost or separated from the seminary. This commitment will require time, effort, and financial support. Since the beginning of May, over $5,000 has been raised toward our goal. Our first priorities are to restore Joan of Arc, the, Greek, the grief of Cyparissus, Hiawatha, and Theo and Leo, the reclining lions. Now, several of these statues will be very expensive to restore. I think Carol's comments made it very clear as to why that is so. Uh, it is possible to restore them, but expensive to do so. Uh, Hiawatha and Joan of Arc, for example, were painted with chrome-based paint, and it's expensive to remove that, difficult, dangerous. Um, we need to raise about $3,000 more to restore Joan of Arc, and we want to do that by this spring. Hiawatha will be even more difficult to clean and repair. Uh, that, that work has to be done in a controlled environment, off-site, and it will probably cost over $13,000. Not all of the statues will be, re will be that expensive to repair, but certainly there are others beyond the ones that I've mentioned uh, that are in that, in that category. Now, I mention dollar amounts for the obvious reason. We need substantial public, corporate, and foundation support. We will have a far better chance of winning that support if we are able to demonstrate that the members of Save Our Seminary and the residents of National Park Seminary and the neighbors in the surrounding neighborhoods to the seminary have been generous in their support, in your support. 
You probably received a brochure when you came in, or at least you had a chance to, they were on the table, a, a brochure for the sculpture uh, project. If you didn't, you can get one on your way out. And that brochure, I think, provides all the information you need to have. Uh, if you take it home and you read it, and you think about how important the campus is in all of its beauty, how important it is to you, and how important it is to the community, then please consider making a generous gift to Save Our Seminary to support its sculpture project. So that's my, my last word to you, and now I hope I will hear words back from you uh, uh, in the form of uh, questions and, uh, oh, right, right off the bat. Yeah, I have two questions. The homeowner with the four statues, does he have uh, paperwork or documentation? It's my understanding that he, that he does, although this, this goes, goes back to the 1940s, and I think it was done pretty casually. Uh, we did talk to a lawyer, and, and the lawyer said that even if he didn't have convincing paperwork, we don't have convincing paperwork uh, that would defend uh, you know, our position either, that cases like this really, really do illustrate the, the uh, uh, possession is nine-tenths nine of the law. Now, he knows, he knows that that if he ever wants to give it up, he knows what to do with it. He, know, he knows we want it. But he also knows that he wants it. It's an important part of his childhood. It's an important part of his family history. Do you uh, know of any other, because I feel like I've seen statues over in yards in that direction. Uh, occasionally we hear of a statue. I, I, heard, I heard just today of the possibility of a, of a statue uh, that looks awfully like one that is, that is missing, or two that are missing from, uh, uh, from the seminary. Um, and when we hear, we'll, we will do our best to track them down. And if we can convince the owner to give them to us, we will take them. And if we can convince the owner to sell them, we'll consider it buying them. And if we, if we can't do either of those, we will, the next best thing is to photograph them, to document them, to get the history in, in writing as best we can, and to display that information on site here at the seminary. My last question is about uh, Joan of Arc. What about the statue tells you that it's Joan of Arc? It's, it's not it's oh, oh, about, about Joan of Arc, um, what is it that tells us about, tells us that that statue is Joan of Arc? I actually can't answer that question. I hope somebody else can. It, it, it looks, it, it, it is, it is a, a, I have seen photographs in, of Joan of Arc in that, in that style, in that appearance, in that posture, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and as well as photographs of statues very similar to this one. Uh, so, so, I'm, I'm, so I accepted without, without too much uh, uh, investigation. And, and it is always referred to in, in the seminary documents okay. as being Joan of Arc. Uh, the, the artist's original of that statue that is in the, the Museum of Luxembourg, and it is called Joan of Arc. So. Uh, about 15 years ago, I saw the wonderful Warner Brothers movies of their twin daughters when they were here in the 19, I guess, 20s. Is it ever possible to see those films again? That's part of our uh, that will probably be part of our um, movie night here. We do have copies of, of some of the old um, advertising films from the seminary, and that I believe is probably the plan for, for next year's lecture like next year's, year's programs. One of our events is going to be movie nights. We don't have a firm schedule yet. Mm -hmm. Gentleman in the back with the red striped tie. Might we consider uh, adding to the uh, schedule for the, the next year's lecture series something about the indoor sculptures. Should we, should we add to the, uh, to the schedule for next year a session on the indoor sculpture? Writing it down. All right, I guess, I guess the answer is yes. Other questions? Uh, Anne. I have a question, actually, it's probably for Carol, uh, because I don't know if that, as much about um, zinc or Right. That are made out of cast or, or zinc. 
um, and it's supposed to look like stone. There's right. Like stone memorial. Yeah, that's what the Gettysburg I'm one is. That, that that was the intent with the sculpture on the seminary was to have them look like marble or a granite or something. No bronze, I'm pretty sure. The, there there was uh, one company called the Monumental Bronze Company out of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and, and they had affiliates other places that specialized in uh, cemetery monuments. And that 4th Ohio Infantry Monument at Gettysburg that I showed you right at the beginning is one of those. Um, th those were very particular uh, kind of, um, th that's, a, that's one type of monument. Uh, and and those, were, th those were the ones that were sandblasted at the foundry uh, and coated in such a way that they um, formed a sort of white corrosion product and, and were meant to imitate stone, even though they were called white bronze for who knows what reason. Um, but those white bronze ones aside, almost all the other ones were painted. Uh, occasionally things were plated. That was not very common in this country, though. Lou? Yeah. Um, it seemed as though these weren't commissioned or one of the one of the um, were, they, were they mass produced? Yes, they were mass, they were mass produced. So well, occasionally there were, there were statues that were made in zinc that were one-offs. For instance, the Smithsonian has a statue over the doorway of the Arts and Industries Building, Columbia Protecting Science and Industry, which was a unique statue, but most of them were uh, mass produced and sold through trade catalogs. We did a we did an article uh, uh, for our newsletter. Oops, we, we we did an article for our newsletter on Hiawatha once, and and in in that article we traced uh, the number of uh, small communities uh, around the uh, country that that own a Hiawatha uh, uh, statue, but have strangely enough uh, named it something else. Uh, you know, often after uh, after after their town, we even even identified. Uh, uh, such a statue in, uh, well, we, we, someone thinks they identified uh, the same statue in a town in Peru, uh, <laughs> but some Peruvian cowboys uh, got drunk one night and uh, lassoed it and pulled it off its pedestal and, oh. and uh, dragged it through the town and it was destroyed. Uh, sorry to have to report that. But yes, there were a lot of Hiawathas and we can assume a lot of the others as well. Yeah. There's an entire book written on them. Well, it's more of a pamphlet. Mm -hmm. Gentleman in the back. Uh, granted that there may be a, a program about these statues uh, next year, is there anything that anyone can say right now about uh, the material from which they're made or, uh, or anything about them? What can we say about these statues? The answer lies in Bonnie's plaster, yeah. I think. <laughs> because I help clean a lot of them <laughs> and dust them clean. off. Um, they are plaster. Um, I would say all of them are plaster. At least four of them were restored, put back together, or pieces attached, reattached when the ballroom was restored. Um, they are various figures. Um, there are some mythological, literary. We have George Washington up here at the top. We have Christopher Columbus over here. Um, and it is marked, interestingly enough, the Christopher Columbus statue is marked that we think it may have been a model for the um, Columbus Circle fountain in front of Union Station in D.C. Um, but there are, you know, there's, you know, cherubs and that kind of thing. Um, Bonnie, but we can certainly can do a program. Just a little bit how you actually did it. Did you put ladders up there or did you take them down? <laughs> no, there was a floor built on scaffolding in the ballroom. We had sca the whole floor here was full of scaffolding and a plywood floor was put at just above that third, the top balcony level so that we climbed up the scaffolding and walked. And that's how the chandeliers were cleaned, that's how the ceiling was painted. And so, Michelangelo. and Michelangelo, right, kind of a la Michelangelo, right. Kim? Were the pockets um, designed for the seminary, or were they a mass-produced uh, item? Basket, basket bearers. Uh, Kim asked if the basket uh, bearers, uh, caryatids, uh, were uniquely designed, designed uniquely for the seminary. And I, 
I don't know the answer to that, but I, I think that they were not, that they were bought, you know, um, uh, it, as, as a group and that they existed for some other purpose. Uh, and, then, and so the question would be, what about, what about the covered walkway? That would have had to have been, I would guess, designed uniquely for, for the seminary. Mm -hmm. But I'm speculating here beyond anything I know. I do that a lot, but uh, yes? A question about this particular photograph. You uh, mentioned, if I understood correctly, this is made of marble. Yes. And, it, and it's outside, and it's a weathering well. Uh, it, 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 it is outside. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, it, it shows, it shows some, some signs of, of wear, but not, not what uh, the, the conservator who looked at it uh, when, a few months ago uh, did, did, not, did not see evidence of tremendously, you know, uh, uh, bad wear. Uh, it is uh, located in an area where there are a lot of trees uh, which shut out the sun uh, and, and, and uh, uh, so that creates a moisture problem, uh, you know, inability for it to dry thoroughly out and that was a problem. But those trees have been trimmed back um, uh, so that, that should improve. Uh, but yes, uh, it's, it's marble and it's outside and it's, and it's, and it's looking awfully good. Yes. Yes. What, what year was that stolen? Hmm. What year was the water bearer stolen? Does anyone remember? <coughs> 2004. 2004? Fairly recently. Mm -hmm. And if, there, if money was no object, how many statues do we have that we could restore? Oh, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I have, uh, I have a list. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It's about 20. Some of them are pairs, so that, so that there actually would be more than that. You know, some of them are in sight on the campus, uh, and, and, and others are in storage uh, uh, and, and can be returned to the, to the, to the campus with, with cleaning and, and other work. Some are, in, some are broken. Some are in, in very bad shape, and whether they can be restored uh, uh, is, uh, is a challenging question. So, so it adds up to a substantial number uh, of, uh, of, of statues. Certainly, as, as Carol has pointed out, some of them are just gone. They're just missing, and our chances of getting them back, I would say, are slight. Uh, but but we, can, we can get a lot more statuary out there than we have now. Other question? Is the Griffin's head gone, or is that just separated from the I can't remember. Uh, and I... Bonnie probably knows. I vaguely remember uh, that there were pieces of two of them. Is that right? The, the, the Griffins. Griffin the Griffins that I, were in the basement. Right. There, there are two Griffins, uh, the pair that were sat right across from the fountain at the front door of the original inn in the main building here. Uh, the, the heads are missing. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. both, of them, both of them. I mean, they could only be recreated from drawings or photographs. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have the wings, a couple of the, I think there's one of the wings of the griffin that's missing. We have two, or maybe two wings are missing. Uh, there was another woman in the back, a blonde woman. Uh, yes, 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 you're turning around, but it is you. <laughs> oh, is it Margaret? What needs to be done to Hiawatha and and, and Joan of Arca. What was the rest of the question? Horse, the horse fountain. Oh, the horse fountain. The horse fountain. The horse fountain. Somebody else will have to answer for the horse, for the, for the, uh, for the fountain. Bonnie can answer that. Um, they, the Hiawatha has, has some, um, uh, well, first Hiawatha has to have the wasp nest removed uh, <laughs> uh, before much of anything can be done. The pedestal needs some repointing. Uh, the statue itself, um, Needs, needs, needs to, be, to be cleaned. The surface, it's more than cleaning. The surface is in very rough, rough condition. It's suffering from, from, uh, from exposure. Uh, the the, the chrome-based chrome paint needs to be removed, and that is a very challenging process. Say that again. It's not, 
I think you wouldn't get a very good bond probably because it's quite deteriorated. It's yeah. coming. It's partially coming off. The, the, one of the expensive parts is that uh, that paint contains not just chromium but also lead, and so you have to do uh, proper remediation for removal. That that's one of the expensive parts for both mm -hmm. both of those metals. And there is there are some repairs to the statue itself. The bow the bow, for example, needs needs some repair work. Um, Joan of Ackley has. It has less need for repair. Uh, it is in better condition, uh, uh, and it can be repaired on site, at least as far as we can tell right now. But it still has to be has to be cleaned and and the uh, uh, the, the paint uh, remediated, uh, and 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 both of them should be repainted, probably in a bronze kind of. Well, the, no, Joan of Arc doesn't need paint. She might, jo maybe Joan a, doesn't need no, it. No, maybe yes. a okay. protective coating. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Joan, does, Joan is bronze. She doesn't need to be painted to look bronze. Okay. But the, the other part of the question was the status of the fountain and the horses' heads. Well, as you may all know, the fountain has been restored with three horses' heads. Yeah. Um, one, uh, one of the heads was missing since about the 1970s and was recreated uh, from a mold of one of the other horses' heads. Um, and uh, the top basin, the very smallest basin on top, was, was newly made uh, to match the lower basins um, and put together and it became functional with water running through it last September, I guess it was September. The history of it? The history is based on only what we know from the school catalogs, which says it came from a villa in Italy. And it, Right, we do know that, yes. And so we're gonna do further research on that because um, we have found, as I think Fred mentioned about something else, that not everything in the school books is exactly right <laughs> or accurate. Um, so, but it is still a beautiful fountain and we're thrilled that it's here and um, we're able to restore it and make it work again. It's gonna, it stopped, we turn off the water in the winter um, because it would freeze and sitting in the basin, so and then we cover it with a um, a blue tarp that looks kind of like a, <laughs> a condom. <laughs> um. Other questions? <laughs> because it's woman, I'm pointing right at you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. You. No. Th no. This woman here, and then and then you next. Yeah, you're talking about the, the zinc ones. Yes, there, there often is. The, the dogs, for instance, are uh, uh, copies of antique statues, uh, and um, uh, many of the, but they're all different things. Lots of them are, cl are classical statues. Uh, some of them, Uh, well, sometimes there are names attached to classical statues. Uh, the lions, for instance, are, were modeled by a fellow named Schiffelmann in, in Berlin. Uh, the, um, the seasons, I think, uh, were a, a German artist who had, the, uh, but he had a French name, Tondeur, not very well known. Um, some of the others are, are more famous. So. Okay, the gentleman with the beard. I was just going to ask about the, um, if, if any of the original molds exist from uh, the zinc manufacturer. Well, uh, it, what, the, I mentioned uh, uh, J.W. Fisk, which was one of the other uh, major retailers, um, and um, Joseph Fisk, who's uh, the scion of the family, he's about 90 now, I think, uh, lives in Princeton, New Jersey, and he's got a few in his basement. Uh, the, the molds uh, and uh, um, um, the patterns for those statues were considered very valuable assets, and there's a lot of correspondence and legal stuff about uh, who owns the molds and, and what they're doing with them. Uh, and so I think when the firm uh, uh, quit selling things, they, they took the molds back. Or when, when Seeley closed down, I think Fisk took the molds back and, and stored them, um, which is why he still got a few. Other questions?
Kim? Uh, slightly tangential, but what's the latest on the relandscaping for the Glen, you know, in terms of being a place for the statue? Relandscaping for the Glen. Uh, what's, the, what's, where do, where do re landscaping plans stand? The landscaping for the, for the Glen part down yeah, right there. First it was they were going to redo the formal gardens, then they were going to leave it natural and wild. Mm -hmm. what? It's pretty much going to be left natural. I mean, they did at the very bottom of the Glen, a lot of it was cleared out uh, to put su new sewer line. Um, and so that, and the new trees were planted where they lost some of the, the, the growth. But a lot of it is still overgrown. They did clean some gardens on the slope down behind Sybarissus. Um, but essentially the glen itself will remain uh, natural, um, but still trying to control the invasive species down there. Um, and that the glen does have a, a conservation easement on it. So nothing will ever be built on it, it is protected. Um, so. Well, there are steps that go down, you know, original steps that go down to the bottom and over uh, to the other side of the castle. That will remain. Um, but the trail, it, it's really a matter, it's going to be a long-term, probably um, resident-driven <laughs> restoration. <laughs> so any weed warriors out there? <laughs> can, we, can we have just two more questions? And, okay, yes. This is just a, a, a question about signage. Maybe we should put a sign up that says, uh, uh, no statue of last wing by drunken uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, here, here, here. I'm, I'm, I'm for that. Yeah, we chose. Okay. One, one more question. We've got, a, you had one. Let's, let's do this one and we we'll go to a third if we need. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, what's the total fundraising amount that you're shooting for in order to do the entire hour of We haven't worked up a budget for the entire range uh, of, 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 of statues that are potential. Uh, and, and when we initially, uh, kicked off the campaign, our goal for the first year was $20,000. Uh, it became clear very quickly that that was much too modest a goal uh, and, and that our sources of funds would have to include corporate and foundation and other larger givers as well as, as, as uh, individual givers. Um, so, so we're in the process of kind of working through what a, what a total goal will be. I mean, part of it's deciding, you know, are there some statues that we're just going to admit can't be put back together? You know, are, are, are there, how much should we devote to photographing and documentation of things that we can't get back? Uh, how much should we concentrate on actual physical statues that, are, that can be put back quickly? Uh, it, it, uh, but certainly the $20,000 goal that we talked about in May uh, won't be enough. Okay? Now, let's just go with one more question and then we'll... To follow on to that discussion about the landscaping, uh, should I understand from your presentation that some of the statuary is on the opposite side of the beltway? No, not the opposite side of the beltway, but the opposite side of the glen, very close to the beltway. Okay, is that... Uh, that's